Good evening, everyone. My name is Aileen Novick. I'm the manager of public and education programs here at the Worcester Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for this, our first master series lecture of the season. We are delighted to be able to welcome you back to these programs. Um, our members council, a community of members at the museum hosts the master series lecture. And on behalf of the members council, I'm thrilled to share this program with you. Thank you to all the, pro the members watching this program at home. You make our museum function and we encourage you to become a member if you're not one already. Your support continues to grow our museum and help us with our mission. Um, please join me in thanking our master series sponsors, including our lead corporate sponsor, ABV. We thank them for their continued support of these great programs. We hope you enjoy this Zoom program. This is the first master series we've done via Zoom. So you have been muted as you came into the program, um, but there will be time for questions and comments at the end of this session. Um, so we would ask that you use the function in Zoom to raise your hand so we can see that you have a question, or you can type your question into the chat as well, and I will help relay those to our speaker. Now I will introduce Claire C. Whitner, our Director of Curatorial Affairs and the James A. Wilu Curator of European Art to begin the program. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Aileen. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first Zoom Master Series. Uh, I'm just so pleased to be able to introduce Diane Radicki as our first speaker of this, of this season. Um, and Diane, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, but I'm sure you can correct me when you get started if I haven't. Um, and just a sort of intro into how our paths crossed. Uh, we purchased our painting, Three Boys Bathing by a Canal by Paula Motors and Becker from the Gallery Saint Etienne in New York. And I received an email from one of the women who works there who said that uh, Diane had reached out to them because she was excited to hear that a museum had, um, had purchased this painting and that it felt like it was an important piece for it to go into a public collection and would it be okay if we could be connected. And I said, of course, and the Gallery Saint Etienne is a really special, wonderful place. Um, it feels like family. It, one of my dear friends worked there from 1939 until 2018, um, basically her entire lifetime as a professional. And really something that they've been incredibly important in doing is promoting the work of female artists, in particular, um, Kate Kolvitz, which is how I was brought into that sphere, uh, but also Paula Morrison Becker and artists like Grandma Moses as well. Um, so I was incredibly excited to meet yet another person that was part of the Saint Etienne family. And Diane and I had hoped our paths would cross when she was hoping to visit with child Otto Dix and Carmen Winant when that was on view at the Worcester Art Museum last fall. But um, it was not meant to be. And so here we are meeting for the first time via Zoom. Uh, but we wanted to figure out a schedule for our master series that would allow us to bring attention to works in our collection. And, you know, when I first encountered Diane's work, it was through her, um, her book, uh, the monograph on Motorzone Becker, uh, Paula Motorzone Becker, the first modern woman artist that was published by Yale University Press in 2013. So I thought, what better way to bring attention to our recent acquisition than to have the expert on this material speak about it. Um, Motors on Becker has been an abiding interest for Diane. Um, basically, it goes back as far as eight, 1980, and I would imagine probably before that, uh, 1980 was the publication of the translated and edited Motors on Becker's letters and journals that um, Diane produced. And then later, Motors and Becker was the subject of her dissertation at Harvard. And what is sort of amazing and almost hard to believe, but probably not terribly surprising, is that this was the first dissertation to come out of that department on a woman artist in 1993. Uh, 
she is a professor emerita of art history at Moravian College, uh, where she also directed the Payne Gallery. And now she lives in New York City. And by virtue of this wonderful remote technology, we're able to listen to her speak tonight. So uh, welcome. And I've been looking forward to this for some time. So I hand the baton over. Thank you, Claire. Oh, um, thank you for the invitation, and especially the invitation to uh, talk about your painting. Uh, I want to, there we go, uh, to talk about the museum's painting because it's been a favorite of mine for a long time. First time I saw it was, ooh, 1970s. And um, I've seen it, I saw it afterwards uh, in several, exhibitions at uh, Gallery Saint Etienne. Uh, and here was an opportunity now, finally, to learn a little bit more about it and to think about it in terms of the thesis that I had written um, and turned into that Yale book. So my lecture is titled Making My Claim in Another Way, which is a quote from Mutterzone Becker um, in a famous letter at the end of her life about what she intended for herself professionally. And it became uh, the clarion call here for building this lecture to find out exactly where this painting of these three nude boys uh, stands in her oeuvre. It's uh, only a part of it, and we don't really get to them until near the end, but um, uh, it's a lovely journey. Thank you. Uh, so this is Making My Claim in Another Way. It's about the nudes of Paula Motorzone Becker. And I want to answer the question that I put forward that you saw first slide up to various friends and people I knew who were also interested in Motor Zone Becker. I first learned about her in 1968 in Chicago as an undergraduate at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle. And then as Claire has already told you, I translated her writings. That came out of my experience at Hunter College where I got my MA and eventually I did go to Harvard for my PhD and I wrote a dissertation on the criticism, the posthumous criticism of Motorzone Becker. And as a dissertation focusing on a woman artist, indeed, it was the very first out of uh, Harvard. And that's 350 years or better of history for Harvard itself and way over 100 years of uh, the art history department being there. So. I wanted to say that. Um, I also want to speak a little bit about this painting because telling you simply that I learned about it in a college classroom in 68 sounds uh, easy enough to do. What you have to understand is in 68, in the art history surveys, there were no women artists. I know we've gone over this ground uh, historically now for a long time, but when this a uh, slide was shown in class. It was because the professor, John McNee, who was an artist, not an art historian, um, had seen this painting during World War II when he was serving abroad. And as an artist, whenever he got a chance to uh, go to museums, um, he would photograph whatever it was that he saw that he was interested in. And he photographed this painting by Motorzone Becker, some other Motorzone Beckers too, and brought them back with him to the States because in the slide libraries that we had, we also didn't have um, any images by women artists. So he was teaching us modern art. It came to uh, German art in the early 20th century, and we were studying all the definitions for German expressionism, which I thought I had under my belt until he threw up this slide. And he said, she's German, she's of the right period. 
Uh, she's often thought of as a German expressionist, I think. He said, I have to tell you, I think, because there's nothing on her in English. And he said he didn't read German, but he brought it into the classroom because he said he found the painting itself so interesting. And he said, why not? Let us deal with it. We're not going to have any data, any facts between us and the object. Let's go, kids. And two things. Um, for one, I looked at it and I thought, this can't be German expressionism. Wait, wait, no. Uh, this upsets every definition I have been memorizing about what the movement is and what uh, modernism is, what self-portraiture is. But on top of that, um, I did not realize at the time that when I would later try to find out more about this painting, there was no way that I could find out anything about nude self-portraits simply because they had never been painted. Uh, that set me up. And so, I, oops, there we go. Um, when it came to studying modern art, I understood that the nude in modern art history is the picture of big ambition that Picasso, Duran, Matisse, they were all claiming their places, jockeying for their places in 20th century modernism, the new century of art, with images of the nude. Now this is before 1907 for Picasso, so for uh, before Demoiselle d'Avignon, but he was doing very substantial nudes like this. And then on the scene came uh, Andre Duran with his bathers, which excited everyone when it was uh, displayed in the salon. Matisse came out with his blue, no blue nude here in 1907, and that provoked Picasso to paint his Demoiselle d'Avignon. So there was competition uh, among these young Turks here uh, for their place in modern art, and it was all based on the nude. Well, Motorzone Becker was of that time. She was in Paris, same time, the turn of the century, 1900, 1905, 1903, 1905, 1906, 1907. And she too was aiming to claim her place in modernism, her place was going to be a revolutionary rethinking of the nude. And I discovered that her most famous nudes were mother and child portraits, nude, self-portraits, nude, children, nude, and that these nudes really had no art history. So while Matisse, Picasso, etc., Oh, uh, they were challenging the nude with new forms. Morrison Becker was actually challenging this nude with definitions of who is nude. What is the nude? Because if I take you back here, you will see these are all women, um, with probably the exception of this figure, debated nowadays, but it is a nude women of a certain age with a certain kind of uh, comeliness, all of which are painted for what we uh, came to start calling the male gaze, the male painter painting for a male uh, patron. And this is something else. This is not that uh, sexual availability, comeliness. Uh, there is something else going on here and it has to do actually more with a sense of being, which is what she will infuse into her nudes at every juncture here. So with that, I said I would um, introduce you to Motorzone Becker with the idea of trying to explore how it was she came to this new idea about what the nude was, who could be nude, um, who could be who could be worthy of being painted nude. So uh, in case you don't know 
Motors on Becker. Here's um, a thumbnail outline of her important dates. Uh, her childhood is spent in Dresden and Bremen. And uh, Dresden is not so far from Berlin. Uh, Bremen is up north. Uh, they're very far away from each other. Dresden, beautiful city, described as the Florence on the Elba uh, at one point. Bremen is something else. Bremen is a port city. So uh, she moves with her family, her family moves, I should say, there in 1888. She's 12 years old. But before she moves, she has an experience in Dresden that will mark her and mark some of her later paintings, especially these paintings of children and children together. When she was only 10 years old, she witnessed the death of her 11-year-old cousin, who was buried alive uh, in a sand pit near Dresden. She was there to see this happening, and she was there with her cousin's younger sister. She was protecting the younger sister at the moment of her older sister's death. So uh, keep it in mind, it'll come up again when we come to the nudes of children. Mm, important for you to know about uh, Motors on Becker, especially seeing those images I just showed you, the, the mother and child, or even herself, they're very uh, substantial uh, women. One would tend to think that she herself was a country girl, a country lass. I want you to know that her education was done in the, um, most sophisticated places, cities that Europe had to offer, began with uh, two months that she spent at art school in London. She then spends two years at art school in Berlin. Um, it is in between uh, terms at Berlin that she goes to this art colony, Borpsbeda. And after that, she goes to Paris. So with an education in London and Berlin and Paris uh, beneath her, uh, behind her, uh, these are interesting images to contemplate in what she is claiming uh, for herself and her, her place in modern art history. Um, what happens after her first trip to Paris, which she does after she uh, graduates or finishes, art school in Berlin. Um, she goes to Paris for six months and she was thinking about Paris uh, quite early on. Um, I make note here that when she was in Berlin at the Drawing and Painting School of the Association of Women Artists, uh, she was already making notes about Paris ateliers and schools on her drawing pads. We have them. Uh, so we know that uh, she had plans for herself, even uh, as a young woman. She goes to Paris in June, uh, from January until June. And the most important thing uh, that she discovers in Paris at that time is Cezanne. And this will stick with her uh, in ways that uh, no, other, uh, no other painter has uh, such a strong influence on her early career. But before she, um, I leave uh, Vorpsvater, her first introduction to these art colonies, I, to this art colony, I want to tell you that uh, she went to the art colony in order to study with a figure painter. Now, the art colony was well known, of course, for landscape painting, with one figure painter who was uh, among the uh, founding crew, and that was why she went there. She wanted to study with him. And there she meets a young woman, a young sculptor, a student in the class that she is taking with Fritz Mackensen. This is Clara Vesthoff, and Clara becomes her BFF, her best friend. Uh, but also important at the time in this first encounter in Vorpsveda is her meeting the landscape painter Otto Motorson. She is Paula Becker. She is known to us as Paula Motorson Becker. So you all can figure out what happened in between. And it'll come up on this side of 
this uh, chronology here. This is her life in effect professionally. She returns from uh, Paris in 1900 in July to Vorpsveda and in the art colony she meets a poet named Rainer Maria Rilke. Uh, Rilke at the time was a young unknown. He was actually he was there on his way back from visiting Tolstoy in Russia. Um, later on, actually during uh, the lifetime that they will uh, share together, um, he will start to become known as a, a very important lyric poet of the early 20th century. But when they first meet, they are both, she is an art student, he's a, a student poet. And I, Rilke meets Becker, but he also meets Westhoff, Becker's best friend. And Westhoff and Rilke marry in 1901 and uh, in April of 1901. And in May, a month later, Paula marries Otto Motorson. So we have a couple of, uh, we have a pod here going of, of friends. I should also tell you that Westhoff and Rilke um, married in April and they had their first child in December. And I'll leave it to you, add that up. Um, she married, Paula marries Otto Motorson um, and at the time he is a widower with a three-year-old daughter. So she uh, marries into a family and they settle in Vorpsveda. Um, Cezanne is on her mind. And after three years back in uh, Vorpsveda, she longs to go back to Paris for the express purposes of studying and sketching from the new. She's living in an artist's colony. It is in uh, peat country. These are all peat cutters, a real peasant uh, population. There are no professional models there. And among the peasants, you are not going to find adults who are willingly going to model in the nude. Uh, we're still dealing with population and a time when people slept in the clothes they wore all day, you know, and uh, bathed in them uh, also. Later in the 20th century, things would change. But at that time, um, it was a problem for her to be able to find uh, young people, uh, adults, uh, to model for her in the nude. She depended then on children. And you'll see some of the uh, drawings that she did of uh, uh, nude drawings of children um, in Oh, and slide or two from now. Uh, she goes, she does then go to Paris. She goes back to Paris on her own. She can't get her husband to agree to come with her. Um, but she stays away for six weeks. She sketches in the Louvre and she sketches at one of the open um, academies there. And her friends, Westhoff and Rilke, are also in Paris. And should any of you uh, be familiar with Rilke, you will know that he, for a while, served Rodin, the sculptor Rodin, as his secretary. Um, so they, Westhoff is in Paris. Uh, she is studying with Rodin in 1900 when um, Motorzone Becker goes to uh, Paris again. Both Westhoff and Rilke are there. There, they are moving around quite a lot in their marriage, and uh, Paula and her family are really settled in Vorpsveda. Uh, she stays uh, going to Paris, does her well for a couple of years, but uh, come two years later in February, she goes back to Paris for eight weeks. Again, she asks her husband to come with her and again he is not interested but at this time she's doing more than just going and studying the nude now she's interested in contemporary artists and the other post-impressionists having seen Cezanne now she will see Van Gogh in the retrospective of 1905 at the Salon des Independents Later, 19, she'll go back in 1906, she'll see the Gauguin retrospective at the um, Autumn Salon. Uh, she comes back from this sojourn in Paris in 1905, 
and uh, she stays for a little bit, but um, she's very unhappy, very frustrated. She cannot um, move in the situation she's in. And with the help of Rilke and Vesthoff, they're the only friends with whom she uh, confides. Uh, she is feels estranged from her husband. She feels estranged from Forbes Veda too. And uh, she leaves. She leaves and uh, settles in Paris. And when I tell you she leaves, I really do mean she leaves. She leaves in the dead of night and doesn't tell her husband. He wakes up the next morning and finds that, that uh, all of her clothes are out of the closet and wonders what's happened. Um, she does, this is the moment of her great experimentation. Uh, the paintings in Paris in 1906 and 07 are paintings that have never really been seen before. But this is a moment when women did not control their own money and she found it more and more difficult to uh, be able to support herself, pay her bills. Her husband, he was a good guy and he did, he was a painter and he did recognize her talent. And he responded when she asked him, though she left him, uh, when she writes to him and asks him for money in order to pay her rent. Eventually they reconcile and she gets him to come to uh, come to Paris. And he comes to Paris in October of 1906. Uh, they stay there together in Paris until 1907 when she becomes pregnant. And then uh, she will return to Vorpsvede in order to give birth to uh, her daughter, November 2nd. And uh, shortly thereafter, 18 days thereafter, not quite three weeks, uh, she dies of what these days is thought to be an embolism. So kind of the after effects of um, her first childbirth at the age of, she was over 30, 31 when she died. And this was dangerous for women uh, at this point. I stretch a little bit beyond uh, her birth and death to give you one more year to pay attention to. And that's 1927, two decades after her death. She who died without any um, attention to her work uh, during her lifetime has a museum erected to her in 1927 in Bremen. It is the first museum in Europe to be built to a woman artist. Uh, in this museum, there is a lot of work. Uh, she had a 10 year span, work span. She painted almost 750 paintings in those 10 years. So that's what happened. Um, and how did it happen and where did it happen? Her professional life, as I said, plays out between this 19th century rural art colony. She has her studio right there and she and her husband live right there. And Paris, and you can see Paris all beautiful and uh, built up. Uh, there isn't a green tree that you can find on this map. So um, we've got a yin and a yang here. Um, when in Vorpsveda, she first goes to Vorpsveda um, because it is near her parents' home. And it is, as I said, between uh, semesters at school. And she goes to study with the only figure painter there. But I wanted to show you this photograph to give you a sense of uh, this peasant on this dirt road and the painters who are out painting, as I said, the landscape. Um, this is her daily life. Here, um, while she is still in school in Berlin and going uh, home on the weekends to Bremen, um, this is a result of one of her drawing sessions with Mockinson, one of those sessions where she meets Clara uh, Vesthoff. Uh, the thing about Mockinson is that he insisted that his uh, students paint what they were painting, draw what they were drawing 
life size when they were dealing with the figure. So there's no way for us to appreciate seeing this on the screen. This drawing is about, uh, it's close to somewhere between four and six feet tall. Uh, and this will start her in the direction of wanting to do um, full nudes and uh, to do them uh, life size. This is her studio. It is cut into the thatched roof of a Vorpsveda barn house. And this is the interior of her studio, a photograph taken of her, Paula, and her friend, Clara Vesthoff. Um, as I said, on, uh, she finishes art school in Berlin, and on January 1st, 1900, midnight January 1st, 1900, she was declaring it her for herself the first day the new century she gets on the midnight train from Bremen and she pulls into the Gare du Nord at sunset and she makes her way by horse-drawn carriage to Montparnasse where she meets Westhoff who is already there studying with Rodin so Motors on Becker um, for the next six months will draw at the Academy Cola Rossi and she will uh, go to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. They give free anatomy lectures. She goes to the Louvre. This is 1900 in Paris. This is the World's Fair. Uh, this is an opportunity actually to see the world's art at the Exposition Universelle de Paris this time. She goes to the salons. She also makes her way to Rue Lafitte. This is the center of the contemporary art market. These are the galleries that are dealing in um, the contemporary artists. And it's here that she discovers Vollard's gallery. And at Vollard's, she will see Cezanne. So understand that it's not in an exhibition. Cezanne himself is not uh, really known in 1900 the way he is known today. So she finds him on her own. Just a little more uh, Maison Saint for you here. This is Paris's Rue Lafitte. It is on the Swank right bank. It is all of the high end art galleries. This is that Paris map. And I wanted to show you where she lives in um, uh, Montparnasse here. And this is Vallard's. And this is Vallard. Uh, this is the right bank, and she makes her way, she walks, all the way across Paris up to uh, Vallard. Uh, forgive me, this is going to be a lot of reading, but really it is worth it. Um, Cezanne, Paula Motorzone writes to Clara Rilke now in 1907, at uh, the end of her life, she says, Cezanne, hit me like a thunderstorm. Do you still remember what we saw at Vallard's in 1900? And exactly what was Vallard's like? Um, Gertrude Stein was in Paris at this time also. And in the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Stein describes what it was like in Vallard's at this time. Uh, here's the passage. I, I just really love it. The first visit to Vallard left an indelible impression on Gertrude Stein. It was an incredible place. It did not look like a picture gallery. Inside, there were a couple of canvases turned to the wall. In one corner was a small pile of big and little canvases thrown pell-mell on top of one another. And in the center of the room stood a huge, dark man glooming. This was Vallard cheerful. When he was really cheerless, he put his huge frame against the glass door that led to the street, his arms above his head, his hands on each upper corner of the portal, and gloomed darkly into the street. Nobody thought of trying to come in. And Clara, what did she have to say? She writes this, it's a reminiscence about uh, that first encounter 
in 1900 at Ballard's. One day, she, Paula, insisted that I accompany her on a walk to the right bank so that she could show me something special there. She led me to the art dealer, Vollard, and in his shop, since we were left to our own devices, she began to turn the pictures around that were standing against the wall and to choose with great self-assurance a few of them that were of an altogether new simplicity and seemed to be close to her nature. They were pictures by Cezanne, which we saw for the first time. We did not even know his name. In her own way, Paula had discovered him, and this discovery was an unexpected confirmation of her own artistic search. And I want to read into this Gertrude Stein text to tell you, to remind you, that Vollard did not have a show of Cezanne at this time, so these paintings were standing against the wall, and Paula had been there before. She goes in, Vollard lets her in. Vollard doesn't give her any guff. He's not gloomy when she comes in. He lets her put her hands on those canvases, turn them around. She knew where they were. She knew what she wanted to see. She knew what she wanted to show to Clara. And all I can tell you is Bollard knew that she knew and left them alone. It's a real homage to her. What did she say? Vol Cezanne hit me like a thunderstorm. We cannot know which Cezanne's Becker saw at Vollard, but we do know this. And what I wanted to do was sort of simulate that thunderstorm for you by showing you these two paintings juxtaposed. The top is done by Otto Motorzone. It is done in 1895 of a tree. This is what Paula came to, um, to Paris seeing all around her. This is Cezanne. This is that tree right in the center. And this was done in the same year, 1895. This is worlds apart from the other. And this had to really um, upset and or confirm Paula in how she wanted to paint, where she was painting, um, in the criticism she was getting uh, and basically in being ignored um, back home when she saw what she was after being done in Paris this way. She does go back to Paris. Uh, this She sees Cezanne in Paris in 1900. She goes back in the summer of 1900 and love is in bloom. Uh, here is the wedding picture of Rilke and uh, Clara, April 1901. This is a photo of Paula and Otto and uh, her, uh, his daughter, her stepdaughter now. This was done a couple of years later. I could never find a, a wedding picture for uh, the two of them. Um, as I said, they painted landscape in Vorpsveda and so did Motors on Becker. She painted trees also, not exactly landscape, but trees, her way. And this is from her journals about being in Vorpsveda the first time around, 1897. There are some trees there that are quite masculinely bold with strong, straight trunks. They are my modern women. So her husband may have been painting a tree, but she was painting a modern woman. Whereas Vorpsveda artists would paint nature from below <clears throat> the traditional viewpoint, looking up and valorizing it, Motors on Becker would paint it from close up and slightly above, expressing a modern and critical sensibility. And I refer you to the a uh, picture at uh, Wham uh, at the at your art museum because she is doing the same thing here. 
um, those trees, her boys. After her discovery of Paris, in Paris of Cezanne, she returns to the art colony. She paints these nude bathers. Vorps Veda boys caught, somewhat surprised, standing outdoors in full sunlight along the Moor Canal. Um, they were naturally nude. They were not um, uh, artificially nude. She wasn't posing them. She was catching them uh, by surprise. And this was the kind of nudity, at least among children, that um, was, uh, could be entertained in this uh, art colony. She did paint the birch trunk. As she painted the birch trunk, she paints her subjects close up, bird's eye, uh, perspective, creating a dynamic and unstable composition. She's beginning to um, evidence that modern uh, sensibility, even in 1901 and first and foremost in your painting. I want you to know, having looked through the Motorzone Becker uh, catalog raisonné, that this is the only painting of nudes, not simply children nudes, but the only painting of nudes that she does in 1901. She's in Vorpsveda. She is thinking about her experience in, uh, in Paris recently. And uh, this is what is going to propel her to go back to Paris. She goes again in 1903, 1905. She wants again to draw from new models and to sketch in the loop, but now she also wants to examine Vorps Veda with a critical eye. An eye which at that point was being caught by the post-impressionists, Tango, Gauguin, and the most, most modern artists. So she says, the most, most modern artists that she saw were at the Salon des Indépendants, which at that time was holding a Van Gogh perspective, re retrospective rather. And she sees this Van Gogh in that retrospective. But she, who are these most, most modern artists that she sees? Well, the Salon at that year had more than 4,000 artworks on display. This was where you went to see contemporary art. Among them were Bonnard, Delaunay, Denis, Derain, Flamenc, Katie Kovitz, Matisse, Rousseau, Seurat, Signac, Vuillard. She saw all of this. Later, the following year, when she would go back, she was going to see a Gauguin retrospective. Keep your eye on this painting. She goes back to Vorpsveda and she starts painting, quote unquote, things which were never seen or painted before. This is what she's just seen. She paints this poor housewoman in a garden. She paints uh, a little uh, later these two girls. This is a painting in the St. Louis Art Museum. And I quote here, from a letter by Rilke to one of his patrons about what was going on in Forbes Veda. He says, Ugh, still the same far distant place, but most remarkable was finding Motorzen's wife at a completely original stage in her painting, painting ruthlessly and boldly things which are very Forbes Veda like and yet which were never seen or painted before. And in this completely original way, she is strangely in affinity with Van Gogh and his direction. So we have her ingesting Cezanne and now uh, Van Gogh. She's there, she's in Vorpsveda. Her friends, the Rilkes, well, they're traveling Europe. And in 1905, Rilke becomes Rodin's secretary. I have a photograph for you here of uh, his uh, wife, Clara, sculpting a head of her husband as uh, they are posing on um, the terrace of a castle in Hessen. And uh, Rilke is searching for illustrations for his forthcoming 
book of poems, the book of hours. Um, this, I ask you simply to compare with uh, this photo of, of Paula, Otto, and Elsbeth in 1905. If we could zoom in on Paula, you would see that uh, she's got a twig in between her fingers. She's sort of twiddling her fingers around this twig. And by this point, because she starts planning, she, she feels the estrangement and she's now starting to plan her escape, uh, actually. Um, she is not a happy camper, to say the least. Indeed, Paula leaves for Paris. Paula leaves Otto and Forbes Feda. I don't know in which position to put those things. She probably was leaving for Paris more strongly than she was leaving Otto and Forbes Feda, but they happen um, at the same time. So there we have her going on that midnight train, February 23rd, 1906. And within two months, she sets up a studio. She starts drawing from live models at the Academy of Colorosi. She attends classes at the um, uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and she goes to museums, to galleries, artist studios, but most of the time she is spending it in her studio on the Avenue de Man drawing and painting. And she knows what she's doing. What she writes home at the time she paints this to her sister is, I am becoming something. I am living the most intensely happy period of my life. Pray for me. Send money. Thanks. Never lose faith in me. She has to pay the rent. And this is uh, the part that wants to engage what she is doing with the nude that is really radical and that she is aware of uh, her new place in this modern uh, century. These are nudes with no art history. Her reclining mother and child nude has no precedent. This is what I have found searching through art history. You can, I can take you back to the Renaissance. There's Giorgione. He has um, mother nude with babe suckling the babe out of doors, but mother has decorously a towel draped around her shoulder. And um, the uh, fact is that mother is upright. Mother is not reclining. If a nude is reclining, that in art history has always meant uh, the sexually available nude. You might think that somebody like uh, Gauguin who was uh, so sexually free would do a mother and child nude and maybe even horizontally. Um, no, he does not. I was surprised when I went through uh, Gauguin material to discover that this was so. I thought he might be a precedent for her. Um, not. She is sitting. She decorously has a towel over her pubic area and she is nursing. The only woman artist I found to deal with the idea of mother and child fully nude is Colwitz, her Pieta in 1903. But this is an entirely different uh, issue. This is a very painful one. Um, I have to bring in your own Otto Dix, pregnant woman. Uh, about the only time we can get um, a mother and child nude is when mother is with child, and that is with Otto Dix or before, um, although still in the uh, 20th century with um, Gustav Klimt. Um, but that is uh, one of the nudes that Motors on Becker does that gets the attention of, of all forthcoming uh, especially women artists, about what this really means. Uh, for anyone to have a place in art history, you, you not only have to be revolutionary in your own time, you have to have a legacy. And with this legacy, we have some of the um, big names in contemporary art here. I want to give you first and foremost, Jenny Holzer. Jenny Holzer, um, who you saw in that introductory slide, said she heard about Motor Zumbecker, heard about her. 
um, when she was uh, in the Midwest back in the 60s and loved her work for its subjectivity and its gravity and its success, Jenny Holzer in 1990 exhibited a text called Mother and Child, which she incorporated into this 39 foot column, which has been installed in the stairwell of the Motorzone Becker Museum. Um, and this is their catalog for this um, exhibition. The other legacy that she has oh, is in um, also in contemporary art. These days, women painters. Uh, here I give you Chantal Jaffe, 2005, and uh, some of you may know this um, painting from, not painting, this photograph from a show that was done in MoMA, but it was also part of a Renica Dijkstra Paula Motorzone Becker portrait show that was held at the Paula Motorzone Becker Museum in 2003. Um, quickly, the nudes with no art history goes into model number two, which is the self-portrait nude. Uh, she painted this, which I introduced you to earlier on. She paints this, um, which is her clarion call, her revolutionary call. She paints this at age 30 on her sixth wedding day, which is for us her fifth wedding anniversary, which would make this um, 19, oh, excuse me, 1906. She paints this when she has left her husband. Uh, he is not in Paris with her. She is making her statement about herself, not as pregnant, but as a goddess, uh, in, uh, responsible for her own agency. Not only has she seen the Venus de Milo, she's also seen uh, Gauguin's uh, women, um, not that they are self-portraits, but she's, she sees a form that she can uh, recognize and uh, utilize. But more than that, she also utilizes a new technology, photography. She has to be among the first women artists to paint uh, from photographs of herself nude. And you will remember this from the self-portrait with Amber Necklace and the other. I thought I'd bring in this one for you because it is a self-portrait by Picasso, very much like hers. But please pay attention. He did this in autumn of 1906. And she did hers in the summer of 1906. And there are other instances of just two tempting possibilities that are not for this lecture, but um, what is her legacy and self-portrait nudes? I give you first Frida Kahlo, who was born the year that Motorzone Becker died, uh, painting herself as a kind of diary of her accident, uh, and she's standing in front of a broken uh, earth, uh, this broken column. Um, I give you Anna Mendiata, who paints her, puts herself into uh, a tree, a goddess of nature. Um, and I also present to you uh, Grace Graupe Pillard's Grace Delving into Art, um, inviting the Venus de Milo to uh, read uh, about uh, Motorzone Becker. I especially want to point out to you Grace, uh, who we see from behind. Grace is 75 years old, and Grace to me is as brave as Motorzone Becker, for she does her, her body, full body nude, whether uh, front or back. There is, um, if any of you are interested in her work, Grace Delving Into Art is on uh, her website. Um, she does this with the same uh, intense look at a body, a female body of any age, um, being uh, a, a apt subject matter for art. It does not simply have to be a sexually active female body. Um, to get finally to uh, your 
painting of uh, children nude, um, I bring you to what Motorzone Becker had to say about that event of seeing um, her cousin buried alive. Yeah, she wrote this for Rilke. She says, in 1886, my cousin Maidley's older sister, when she was 11 years old, was playing with six other children. I was one of them and was buried alive in a large sand pit near Dresden. The rest of us were able to save ourselves. This was the first real event in my life. The first glimmer of self-awareness entered my life with it. And I propose to you that this is what she is painting with children, that first glimmer of self-awareness. At the moment of her death, Maidley and I were hiding our faces in the sand so as not to see the horrible thing that we sensed was happening. I said to her, to Maidley, you now are my legacy. So I give you those and I can give you nothing in art history of these kinds of children. There are plenty of children of nudes, of pooty, uh, but two children together, three children together, nude without an adult. No, it becomes a subject for modern art. Very different from what Motors on Becker does. Um, Picasso does it, as we see in 1906. They share a time period and a sensibility. Kirchner, the German expressionist to whom she was first uh, compared that threw me, uh, really threw me for a loop at the opening of my inquiry about Motors on Becker. He does 10-year-old uh, girls naked. These are prostitutes. They are the daughters of the prostitutes that um, uh, Kirchner uh, spent quite a lot of time painting. He painted these girls often enough so that we know their names. He painted them apart. He painted them together. It's Franzi and um, uh, Maisie. And the other uh, German expressionist at this time who was known for taking an interest in, if not exactly children, then what he called youths, was Kokoschka. He did a book entitled Dreaming Youths. Here he has, uh, with his own definition, a girl and a boy. They tend to look more like uh, young adolescents to us rather than 10-year-olds. Um, but um, his idea of children, too, if they don't seem sexually appealing, they are still put to you in the Garden of Eden, that innocence and uh, sexuality being blended together. What's her legacy? She is her own legacy. She goes back to uh, Vorps Veda. She gives birth and on November 2nd. And one of the first things she says to her friend Clara, and she writes this to her, she says, you should see her in the nude. I've got my own model. Holy cow. She couldn't have been happier. Um, this is what she writes to Clara uh, about uh, Rainer. He, Rainer uh, Maria Rilke has written her to say he's in Paris at this time and the Salon has this great uh, Cezanne retrospective. Tell Paula she's got to come. And he's writing and Paula's about to give birth in two weeks. Mm. My craving to know everything about the Cezanne retrospective in the Salon is so great that I asked Rilke, Rilke at least several days ago to send me the catalog. Please come soon with his letters, letters, preferably Monday, because I hope finally to be making my claim in another way soon. When it's not absolutely necessary for me to be here, I must be in Paris. Uh, this one always stops me. I want to say, Paula, <laughs> you're going to give birth in two weeks. When do you think it's absolutely not going to be necessary for you to be here? But um, that's where her eyes were set. She loved her family. She was grateful to her husband. Um, she didn't 
She didn't go home dragging uh, her heels. She appreciated what it meant to have his support. Uh, but she had a plan and she knew who she was. So that's that. And I thought I would put up this slide with some things that I understand are on view in the museum. And if uh, there are any questions, any time for questions, uh, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That was great. Very fascinating information. So again, if you have a question that you would like to ask, um, please do use the hand function in Zoom, or you can type it into the chat, and that way we'll have the organization. You're getting a lot of excellent presentations in the chat. Paul Mahone, I see that you have a question. If you would unmute yourself. Yes, I, uh, I just, it was more a comment than a question, especially uh, looking at the painting of the three youths. The one in the middle, it has an extremely distended belly and is uh, and very thin arms and legs. And that's normally a sign of a, of a very serious protein deficiency. So I'm, I'm assuming that this might have been a, a poor town from what we heard about it. And that might be one manifestation of the poverty is that that young man is, is uh, in trouble nutritionally. Um, very true. This is a, a village of peasants who make a living by um, uh, farming peat. Uh, they are undernourished often. Uh, they have a poor house uh, that uh, houses many of these uh, children. So um, indeed, that extended belly is what you see. It's also um, a part of a vocabulary for these children. It's not only the extended belly, it is the sway back that you will see, that you might have paid attention to in that drawing, that six foot uh, drawing she did of the uh, young girl. Um, it's uh, the problem of nutrition. It's the problems of their bones. Yeah, this is a very, very poor uh, village. Good for you. Sharp eyes, eagle eyes. Well, you have a I, question from Diane in the chat. What happened to her daughter after her passing? Um, her daughter, uh, I mentioned rather hurriedly that she married a widow and uh, all of a sudden her now uh, re-widowed husband had two children to take care of. So uh, about a year later, he marries again. And um, he marries a, a woman who uh, gives him three sons and she lives as opposed to his first wife who gave him one daughter and died at the age of 31. And his second wife, who gave him one daughter and died at the age of 31. Um, so she was brought up in a family uh, with her father and her stepmother. She bonded very closely with her stepsister. Uh, otherwise, she had uh, stepbrothers. They both grew up. Neither became painters. Both of them became uh, social workers. And uh, they lived, uh, both of them lived a very long life. Her daughter eventually was um, responsible for what is now the Paula Motorzone Becker uh, Foundation. It's where a lot of this material uh, that I can quote letters from and journals and um, uh, where you can see that wonderful infamous amber necklace uh, still exists. Um, that was all put together uh, by her daughter uh, and the people in museums in Bremen and galleries in Bremen. Grace says she appreciate learning even more and thank you for your accompanying visuals. Thank you. Well, I had one question for you. I saw in Germany there was a made-for-TV movie about her that came out in 2016. Did you have any work with that? Um, was, was it for TV or was it the film that was shown here in the States? 
there was a movie, there was actually a movie that was made and had some theater play here. Mm. I'll, I'll tell you whether or not it was the made for TV movie. Uh, the movie that I saw did not grant her any kind of uh, agency in discovering Cezanne. She, as I said to you, she discovered Cezanne on her own. She went back, got her girlfriend to go with her and was showing her Cezanne. In the movie I saw, she has, uh, she finds a French lover in Paris who for some reason, I can't follow this, uh, takes her to a brothel and in the brothel is hanging a Cezanne painting. And that supposedly, according to this movie, is where Motors and Becker saw her first Cezanne in a brothel. So if that was in the TV movie, <laughs> No, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> Nor did um, uh, Marie Dariusek, the uh, French writer whose uh, biography of Motors on Becker I uh, made mention of in that very first slide that uh, prefaced this, um, this lecture. Uh, all of us were just agog. But, you know, a movie is a movie and you've got to sex it up somewhat. I have one other question. How was mm -hmm. she able to fund her art school education and life away from Bremen? Um, she went to art school in uh, Berlin with the help of an uncle and aunt who did not have children. She drew uh, incessantly from uh, childhood on. So she was known in the family uh, for having this particular talent. Her father was an engineer, but in the ways of that world then, her mother was of nobility, of von Bülzingslöwen. And uh, so uh, the families uh, did have money and they were willing to support her in ventures such as the school in Berlin. It was a a woman's school. It was part, it was the annex actually of the Royal Academy School. It was the school for women. Katie Kolbitz went there too. Every woman actually um, went to this, uh, who wanted um, a very substantial art education, went to one of these women's academies. There was one in Berlin, one in Munich, uh, etc. And as long as it had this kind of cachet, her uncle and aunt um, were willing to uh, support her uh, through that. It was a, a gift. She went to school in London because she had another aunt who had married a very wealthy uh, man in London. And her uh, family, her mother and father, sent her to London when she was 16 in order to be polished. Um, they expected her to learn how to manage a, I think her, uh, her aunt and uncle lived in something close to a castle. The trouble was she didn't get along with her aunt, really didn't get along. And her uncle, her British uncle, uh, solved the problem of the two of them by recognizing that Paula had this talent for drawing and sent her off to the drawing school in London all day long, 10 to four, stay out of your aunt's hair. And uh, that was fine with her, you know, so she, by default, she got uh, very, very um, uh, substantial, serious training because the school they sent her given their station in life was a prep school for the Royal Academy. And even when she went, she writes home and says, you know, wow, I'm the youngest one here. Ooh, that's going to be fun. I, you know, it'll really sharpen my sense of ambition, she says, when she is, uh, what was she, 14, 16 years old. Um, Catherine asks, how was her work received in Nazi times? Um, not at all. <laughs> Not well at all. As a matter of fact, um, 27, when the museum is built, um, started the growth of her reputation. By 37, when the Nazis had come in and 
they um, were damning modern art in particular, the German Expressionists. Um, they uh, were also condemning her work and uh, her work was pulled off of the walls of museums uh, throughout Germany. I, I'm told there were some 70 paintings that were taken uh, to Munich to be exhibited in this degenerate art show. Um, and then uh, subsequently to be uh, sold at auction in, um, in Switzerland. Um, but in the degenerate art show, they hung her with um, Franz Marc. And uh, that was a political mistake on the part of the Nazis because Franz Marc had won the Iron Cross during World War I. And even um, tried and true Nazis were uh, a little aghast that uh, somebody who had won the Iron Cross, somebody who was a soldier for Germany, should be called degenerate. So the room in which Franz Marc and Motorzone Becker hung was closed after two or three days and uh, nothing more was seen of it. So uh, Hitler, Hitler had no real audience in Bremen, but he did have an audience uh, somewhat nearby, some following in Oldenburg. And he went and he made a speech there that um, made oblique reference to Motorzone Becker and uh, her ugly peasants. Our peasants are noble and strong and Olympians. You know, he felt that um, her paintings of people who could be indeed starving or, um, mal or at least certainly seriously um, um, malnourished, uh, this did not reflect well on the Germany that uh, Hitler wanted to promote. So uh, she was condemned which given who was condemned, I mean, it's an index to um, modern art in the 20th century. Thank you. You have another question from Kevin. Was Kollwitz influenced by Motorsen Becker? Kollwitz is a decade older than um, Motorsen Becker and Kollwitz who did go to that woman's school actually uh, then came back the year after Motorzone Becker was there to teach at the women's school. But Kollwitz was, um, at the time she was at that women's school, she was directed away from painting and directed more towards graphic arts. And this is how we know her as a printmaker. Um, so they did not have the same uh, subject matter and they did not have the same uh, medium. But Kollwitz was well known uh, from a very early age. Her prints uh, were um, awarded a, uh, a, royal, uh, a royal cross, a royal medal um, by the uh, Kaiser. And uh, with that kind of cachet, when she was really still quite young, she was just a few years, I think, out of uh, school. Um, she then had a public face for the rest of her life. And she um, was married to a doctor who set up uh, his practice in uh, some of the poorest districts of Berlin. She often used um, the uh, people who were coming to see her husband um, as models uh, for her own work. She was engaged with the poor uh, she was engaged as here uh, with the suffering uh, of women and especially of poor women. But Motorzone Becker is not about suffering. She does not paint uh, these children um, in order to elicit uh, your, uh, your sympathy uh, for them. She really is looking at them straight on as beings in their own right. She's not making any um, judgment, and she's not asking soci society to uh, rectify a wrong. And Kollwitz, uh, behind a lot of what Kollwitz had uh, to say in her art was um, the desire, the will for uh, what was wrong to be righted. So it didn't uh, go that way. It, it wouldn't have gone that way simply because Motorzone Becker was um, 
uh, a decade younger than her. She was unknown. Her paintings weren't shown during her own lifetime, not until 1927. Thank you. That appears to be our last question, unless anyone has anything else. And I would encourage you, you know, um, we got to see some images that are up right now, some paintings and prints. You can visit the museum. Just make sure you visit the main website and click on the pink banner that says get tickets because you do have to reserve um, the hour that you're coming and provide some contact tracing information. But please visit our website and come see some of these artworks in person. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for a lovely presentation. Well, thank you, Eileen. Thank you. And thank you, Claire, for this opportunity. I really loved working with this painting and thinking about it and was really surprised. It's the only nude from 1901. You've got, um, you've got the springboard into her own future is what you've got there. Well, I'm so glad you were able to join us to talk about it. Um, you know, all, any of the research I did on it had to happen sort of quickly in order to make the acquisition happen. But uh, so it, it was really wonderful to hear a sort of a much longer presentation and one that's coming from someone who has a much deeper knowledge of her work. So um, I really, really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll actually be able to meet in person <laughs> someday. Yes, wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> oh. Thank you. Well, thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Take care.